Welcome to the podcast, Prashant. Thanks, Peter. Uh, it's always good to catch up, and I think it's been a while since it, uh, we got together. It has been a while. I know my trips to San Francisco are no longer happening uh, ever since uh, early this year. So anyway, uh, let's get started. I want to actually ask you about your interesting um, collection of guitars behind you there. What, uh, so are you, a, are you a, a guitar aficionado? What's, tell us a little bit of story uh, about that. Uh, I am a recovering uh, guitar aholic, I guess. Um, I've been sort of playing jazz, blues, and rock and roll, I guess, for longer than I'd like to admit. <laughs> um, uh, while growing up uh, in India, uh, I ended up playing in what became India's largest selling rock band. Um, unfortunately, I had left to come to the U.S. a oh. couple of years before the debut album was released. <laughs> and the rest is history you know, for the rest of the band, but not for me. Uh, but that said, I, I, do, I do love uh, playing guitar and um, I don't really have like a gigantic collection, but it's sort of a, uh, it, think of it as a working man's guitar collection, which gives me enough sort of variety in terms of tones and sound that I need uh, to play, you know, virtually any kind of music. So that's, right, right. that's, how, I, that's how I roll. Right. So in, in, in another life, you might have been a rock star and not a fintech entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I still uh, ha hang out with a bunch of other tech execs and uh, play in a band called Cover Flow uh, at tech conferences and things like that. Uh, but of course, COVID has definitely, like a lot of other things, has yeah. impacted our, our style. It's scrimmed our style a little bit. But uh, no, I'm glad to be able to, uh, to, to, to play guitar. And as you can see, I have Power sometimes goes out these days in, you know, in the Bay Area, given all yeah. that's happening with the wildfires. So I have yeah. sort of an unplugged uh, sort of uh, yes. backup as well as my electric collection. Yeah, ex exactly, indeed. Anyway, so um, I want to get, a, I want to talk a little bit about your background here. You've had a very interesting background working at some of the, the largest tech companies in the world. So why don't you give the listeners just some of the highlights of your career before Funbox? Sure, sure. I, I think of myself as... Uh, as a sort of tech executive by profession and um, a product manager at heart, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and maybe a perpetual student to always trying to learn things. So I grew up as a product manager in the early days of Google. Uh, so I was part of the AdWords team and the AdWords team was very, very small and built out a very large part of, Google, of AdWords business infrastructure. Uh, also along the way at Google, I did dabble in fintech. It was, wasn't really called fintech at that time. I built out uh, Google's global billing and payment platform oh. just so that we could power the ads business in all sort of the countries around the world. And this was at a time when global payment networks weren't really a thing. And so yeah. how do you go and collect money in China or distribute money to publishers in Brazil was, was like a really big deal for Google because of our global ambitions. And sort of I built that out. And eventually... Uh, you know, when I left Google, I was running all of Google's products for the APAC region. So spent a lot of time in Japan, China, Korea, India, Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, all those markets. Um, and um, I left Google to go to Facebook. And once again, I ended up at a tech company that was very young uh, and in sort of the early days. And for the first couple of years at Facebook, I ran the ads product uh, at Facebook. Um, you know, a lot more controversial product these days, as it turns <laughs> out. Um, and then for the next couple of years, I did the same thing. I ran the payment platform. So I built out the payment platform at Facebook as well. So I know enough to be dangerous in payments, uh, having done that at two different tech companies. But I also think that the world's come a long way over the last 10 years in terms of sort of payment rails and global payment, uh, you know, global, global payments as well. Mm -hmm. um, after Facebook, uh, having, you know, enjoyed the and learned from the search wave and the social wave, I thought about the mobile wave and uh, ended up joining a startup called Flurry, which was actually at that time the world's largest mobile analytics platform, wow. embedded in over 2 billion devices, monthly active devices. And so we were seeing data about the mobile revolution really from all over the world, uh, from the Western world to India, to China, to, uh, you know, to, to Latin America and so on. Uh, Yahoo, uh, Yahoo acquired Flurry and then uh, for a while, I was at Yahoo, once again, ran the ads and data team there. So a little bit of a pattern. Uh, by the time I left Yahoo, um, I was frankly tired of doing ads and advertising <laughs> and marketing systems and solutions and things like that, and uh, was thinking about what to do next. And I got introduced to AI. 
And right when I saw Funbox, um, I think three things just hit me like a ton of bricks, right? One was, whoa, the mission of the company to serve small businesses is something that I could relate to and just felt very real. So mm -hmm. I was like, well, if I'm going to get up in the morning and go to work, I may as well do that for something that's interesting and motivating. Uh, like just a real, the second was a really good team that I, I did. It was a small team at that time. We were mm -hmm. much smaller than we are today, but just really smart folks that can work together really well. And the third was, was the technology, because even at that time, though we were very early stage, I could see that the team had built in just three short years, some very cool and differentiated technology. And, um, uh, and uh, the, the tech team was, was you know, at the same level or better than any team that I'd worked with at, you know, at Facebook or at Google. And so I was very, very impressed and uh, came on board. And you know, here I am four years later, uh, partnering with uh, with Al, you know, who's the founder until recently, uh, the CEO, and uh, just helping OneBox grow and helping us serve our customers. Okay, so then um, maybe you could just tell the listeners who don't know FunBox really well. How, how do you describe it today? FunBox uh, is a fintech company uh, that is uh, focused on helping small businesses and powering the small business economy through innovative credit and payment solutions. That's what we do. Uh, and uh, we work with small businesses today in the US, but we do have global aspirations. Uh, but these small businesses are across a broad spectrum of industries and segments. And we help them by providing them access to working capital and other tools that help them uh, with their you know, financial agility and peace of mind and ability to succeed and grow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Al just uh, recently. He was CEO until, uh, until a short time ago. So just tell us a little bit about that transition. Um, for, uh, you, you, know, you were COO. And um, yeah, tell us a little bit about what was behind the thinking there of you becoming CEO and Al stepping back a little bit. Oh, Sorry to let you down, Peter, <laughs> and your viewers as well, but uh, the transition was like a huge non-event. Uh, Eyal and I have been you know, working together very closely for the last four years, and a year ago, we decided to make a, a transition. It was very smooth and very gradual. Uh, I was managing the core business uh, and a large part of the company before, so it was very, uh, it was very smooth. And Eyal is still very involved with the company as an executive chairman. He, he and I talk every day. And frankly, the, the only meal that I've eaten outside of my home where I am today <laughs> is a meal with Eyal. So, you know, we're, we're working very closely together. And it's just uh, he and I are sort of focused on, you know, sort of different things. He is thinking about the company's strategy, longer term, yeah, you know, capital markets, uh, you know, strategic investors, strategic partners, things like that. And I'm a lot more focused on like running the company. So it's been a great partnership and uh, I hope and expect it's gonna continue for, for a very long time. Okay, okay, fair enough. So, you know, I went back and looked at uh, my notes from some of the meetings that I've had with you over the, over the last couple of years. And, and you said this uh, several times, you talked about the $3.1 trillion problem uh, uh, in the United States of money that's locked in receivables. So maybe you could just, Tell the listeners a little bit about how Funbox is addressing that problem directly. Yeah, happy to do that. So just by way of context, that $3.1 trillion uh, represents all the, the, the money that's owed to, to, a, to a company, sort of, to a business in the B2B space at any given time. And about a third of that so, uh, you know, is, is money that's owed to a small business. So it's a lot of money and, you know, a trillion dollars uh, is, is very, very significant. You can compare it to other big numbers like, you know, total consumer debt or total, you know, mortgage amounts and so on in, in, in the country. Um, the, the challenge with this, these, this, this money that's owed to small businesses is just the opportunity cost. It's just how the economy is not operating efficiently. You can think about all the, investment decisions and the operating decisions companies could make could better could make better if they were to simply get access to that that capital or have more confidence in that capital showing up and uh, the problem is is more pronounced for small businesses and 
and uh, you know, it's 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 a third of that of that number, and it's a number that's rapidly growing. So I think that um, that over the over the course of the last year, uh, the amount that's owed to small businesses has has almost doubled. So it's it's a very very significant uh, impact on small businesses that's sort of been made worse or exacerbated over the last over the last year, actually over the last six months. So. With that problem in mind, you know we're we're working to address that problem to solve that problem, uh, you know, and you know, sort of primarily through credit, and um, and that's sort of what we're primarily focused on. So you know, we we've got sort of a, diff- a few different flavors of our credit products, and uh, through COVID and through the pandemic and the downturn, we've not stopped originating. We've not stopped serving our customers. And we believe that's an important way for us to, to make a dent in this, in this huge problem. We've even continued acquiring new customers during this time. And this access to credit has been incredibly important for them, as you can imagine, uh, through all the, the ups and downs, a lot of downs in there, uh, you know, over the last few months. I mean, the other thing that we've done, which is, of course, more of a one-time thing, is that we've also obviously acted as, an, uh, you know, as, a, as a lender in the PPP program. Mm-hmm. And so uh, through August, we, we worked with the Small Business Administration and the Treasury to be able to originate loans to, um, you know, to, to our customers, but also other SMBs. And uh, rather than acting as an affiliate. So there are a lot of folks who essentially bought traffic and, and acted as an agent, pushing that traffic to a bank to be able to actually originate. We decided to go all in and originate ourselves. And we did that because we wanted to deliver a better customer experience to the, the tens of thousands of people that came to us looking for, you know, looking for credit and whom we served. Uh, by 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 sort of managing the entire experience, we were able to to just just drive just more customer delight uh, than in getting someone in and then moving them over to to some to some other uh, institution. And so, you know, if you if you just take a look at uh, what uh, the impact has been, apart from the obvious financial impact of the company, it was sort of very profitable for us, and you know, we're gonna, we did very well for that. I think more than that, we've We've built up an incredible amount of goodwill in the SMB community by helping. And if you just look at our, you know, trust pilot reviews and in how glowing they are, it's it's a matter of great pride for us. We're we're very very happy about that. And um, uh, and and I think that's sort of another way in which we sort of helped. And we're going to continue looking for ways in which we can help with this 3.1 sort of trillion dollar problem of which over a third is you know is related to smbs not getting paid for something that they have done a product they have delivered or a service that they've mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. okay so then um maybe you could just tell us a little bit about who you are serving you talk about small business obviously there's there's many verticals are you like broadly across all verticals and uh, who's a typical customer of funbox so our customer base is very broad so in terms of Geography, of course, we're focused on the U.S. today, and, but the heat map of our customers looks pretty much like the heat map of small business activity in the United States. In terms of you know verticals, we we don't we're not concentrated or over concentrated in any one particular vertical or segment. We serve you know professional services or scientific technical services on the one hand, all the way to to retail, you know B two C to uh, to manufacturing, to B2B wholesale, to uh, construction, to just about any industry segment. Uh, and uh, that's just because our aspirations are very broad and, and, and we want to be able to serve a broad set of, of, of customers. In terms of size, we typically serve customers that are on the smaller end of SMB. And as you mentioned, Peter, SMBs, some definition of SMBs take you all the way to a company that has up to 500 employees. Our customers tend to be on the smaller side. So ranging all the way from a sole proprietor to someone who has 10, 15, 20, um, uh, maybe up to 50, but not much more than that by way of employees, generating as few as, as little as like $100,000 in annual revenue to maybe a few million 
but not 50 million, right? Like mm -hmm. a, a few million dollars. And, you know, our kind of median revenue is roughly in the 700,000, you know, dollars a year range. So that's, that's roughly the size of the customer. And we focused on this for a reason. Uh, actually, sort of there are two reasons which actually dovetail together very well. One is that this is highly underserved. So the smaller end of SMBs is, is the place where there's the most amount of pain, uh, you know, for, for reasons we can get, get into, but just the, the mechanics of assessing risk and underwriting become very, very challenging using conventional techniques in this, on the, you know, and the payoff is smaller because it's a small customer. They're not asking you for a million dollar product, they're asking you for $25,000 in the line of credit, right? And so that's one, pro one part, it's highly underserved. And actually by serving smaller customers, we, we're also, that's, that's a place where, where technology and automation and machine learning can, can just play more, more effectively because there's scale there. So this is sort of a place where there's actually like a happy, um, uh, you know, sort of a happy combination of both a strong market need, which has not been addressed, and the opportunity for us to just use our approach, which is really much more of a technology-based approach to be able to serve customers at scale. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so I wanna talk a bit about, about that approach, particularly the, the approach to underwriting, because you know, I've, I, I've, I've talked to you a lot over the years and it's, uh, you always talk about um, data analysis and data science and machine learning and, and really uh, your, what you've said is, is a unique approach to, to how, you, how you address underwriting. So maybe, um, can you give us a little bit of color there on what makes uh, Fundbox unique? Yeah, I'm no, happy to do that. And before I say anything, I'm gonna caveat this by saying that almost whatever I say uh, can be said by almost anybody, right? And ultimately the proof of the pudding is in the eating and the performance, but, but here's, how, here's how we think about, about what we've done. Over the past seven years that we've been around, uh, we've made a lot of deep investments in capital, in, in people, uh, in our focus and energy uh, for, for sort of long-term superior performance. And we built a significantly better sort of data and credit machine, which is coming to bear and showing results now and which we'll talk about. But a few things that are, that are pretty important for us. Number one is we've made a huge investment in data. And I'm gonna give you a couple of flavors of that. Um, when you think about data, you think about making predictions. So the first is really around the labels that you can use, the outcomes that you can sort of, you can train your, your, your machine learning models on, right? And what we've done is over, every time we encounter a new data set, we, we're pretty aggressive in how we onboard customers and, uh, and let them get access to credit and see what happens. Because it's only by, by having a pretty broad aperture and letting a lot of customers come in, can you collect enough defaults to train a machine learning model well. So we've not been shy about saying, let's take some risks in terms of the customers you bring on in the early days of any segment, whether the segment is a part of the market or a data source that we are, you know, that we're anchoring on. And let's not be shy about making dollar investments in, in, in those. So in other words, losses, which help train our models, do come at a dollar cost because you're losing principal and that's a big deal. But we've been very explicit about making those investments with, within the company, with our investors and so on. So that's, what, that's a big thing. Another flavor of data investment is spending a lot of time in engineering the features or think of it as the variables that go into models. So we access a number of data sources. You know, many of them, I would say most of them are not proprietary. Uh, we get access to bank account data. Uh, frankly, anybody can access bank account data. Uh, it's getting more and more open. We'll talk about open banking hopefully later in this in in this in this uh, uh, thing. But um, we access accounting software data that's available to everybody too. But what you do with the data you have access to? How much time do you spend trying to understand and develop features from all the thousands of data points, and and then how you look at the power of each of these features is like a really big deal. And so this is something that we've been working on for ever since the company started, such that we have a very uh, significant edge over anybody else when it comes to even extracting features from 
generally available data sources. So I think the combination of one, having a, a large body of defaults that we can train our models on, which is awesome. And then the other one, spending a lot of time on feature engineering, this, these are investments that no one can replicate in six months or a year, or maybe even two. This takes time uh, you know, to, to build out, and we've done it. I think the other things that we've done, you know, there's a lot of things. One thing in particular, which I think is pretty unique about Funbox is that we've been investing in something, and this is proprietary, that we call the business graph. So when a customer comes to us and connects their accounting software or connects their, uh, their bank account, what we're able to do is to understand a lot about the customer, but not about them as an island. We think about them and their interactions with the other businesses that they work with. So this is more important in the B2B context, but imagine if every customer that came to Fundbox brought along some information about between one to 200 other businesses around them. This could be suppliers, it could be customers and so on. And so by putting all of this in a graph, we built out a graph of businesses in the US and their interactions with each other. And of course the graph is not perfect. You don't have every single small business or large business in the US and we don't have every transaction, but we do have a lot of it so that we can derive features from this graph that can help us explain or predict the, the, the risk of a business based on the company they keep, right? Based on the businesses around them. That's a pretty big thing. And, you know, and uh, along the way, there's also like a whole bunch of statistical techniques, you know, that we, we, how we approach sampling, how we structure our models, how we uh, create human readable um, ways to explain the results of our models to, you know, to customers. Uh, all of that is stuff that we've developed. Um, so it is an, a significant investment and, I'll tell you this, Peter, like going through all of this over the last almost four years, um, you always ask yourself the question, everybody's saying the same thing. So is it really worth it? Is what we're doing worth it? And then in a few short months, you get the answer. Right. When the environment goes from being benign to being, you know, where, what we're in right now. And, and, you know, the light bulb went off in my head and I was like, whoa, this actually was worth it. The approach actually made sense, uh, but you know, but it, it's 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 hard, and it's easy to get. Um, it's easy to doubt when everybody's saying you know almost exactly the same thing. What I, what I just told you over the last two three minutes could have been said by anybody. It's easy to say. It's hard to do, and and it's the the, the proof is is in is in the actual performance. Right. Well, so let's talk about that then. I mean, you've had, you know, we've gone through a very rough six months. Obviously, you've, the, you've had the, the PPP, which has sort of helped prop up many small businesses. But um, tell us a little bit about what you've seen loan performance wise that, you know, from the start of the year. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that we've, we've had very strong performance uh, with our loans sort of as measured by on, on any metric. So let's take delinquencies, right? So uh, when COVID hit, you know, our delinquencies have been in the low, the low single digits uh, percentages, right? When COVID hit, we saw a temporary spike. We saw delinquencies rise from low single digits to high single digits, never hit double digits at all in terms of percentages. And that happened for like a few weeks and then they dropped. And so within five to six weeks, we were back at pre-COVID levels. And for the last two months, they've been at significantly below pre-COVID levels. So while we did have some sleepless nights, Jen worried like everybody else was, like, is this the end of us? Uh, what's going to happen? We, we saw things play out in a way that was, that, that really gave us a lot of confidence in sort of our approach, which is, our delinquencies never even ever got to double digit percentages. Now, if you compare this with sort of the story at, at almost virtually every independent FinTech credit platform, the story was more delinquencies rising in the 30 to 40% you know, at, at the peak and, and remaining there for a longer time. So when we looked at the, the portfolio performance of either publicly traded companies, uh, some of which were in the news for, for getting acquired, right? Or some of the, some of the our, our you know, larger 
uh, peers, again, in the sort of in the private uh, uh, sector that also were in the news were getting acquired, we're talking about delinquencies in the 40% range. And so if you think about a 40% delinquency rate versus a 8% delinquency rate, we're not just talking about, you know, just a few percentages better. We're talking about a 5x difference in performance. And it was so significant that we really had to look at it over and over again and think, is there some, is there, are we making a mistake here? Like what's, is it, can it even, can it be real? And it is real. It was a very significant difference. And that's where, that's when over time, you know, just the, the investment in the, in the approach just seemed to be so real and, and so much grounded in, in the reality of actual business performance. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's sort of this joke that, that, that floats around, which is, you know, uh, if it's written in, you know, in Python, it's machine learning. If it's on a PowerPoint slide, it's AI. You know, th there's a lot of PowerPoint slides floating around and it, it's just good to see something real, you know, uh, deliver performance you know, for a change. Right, yep, for sure, for sure. So then what about demand? Um, you know, we've, we're now more than a month um, away from the end of the PPP. Are you seeing demand come back um, strongly or how, tell us about how, how that has flowed over the last few months? So demand has been growing as uh, as the stimulus funds are uh, you know are running out, and and we see all this because we're connected to the bank accounts of our customers, uh, and obviously we participate in the PPP program as well. And so, so we are seeing demand come back. I think um, you know there's there's definitely a need for credit given the the macro environment, right? That's there for sure. There's also a need for credit given that supply has, has dried out. So with, with some of the players not being in the market anymore, in fact, I think we were perhaps, we were almost surely the only independent FinTech to not stop originating. Everybody else did, even some of the, the larger platform players did. Mm -hmm. So there is there's sort of this imbalance between demand and supply. And, uh, and so, so we are seeing demand coming in. And so I think, this is where we talked about sort of focus. And I think uh, the biggest opportunity you see for us right now is we've got this, we've proven that our technology works. We've got a, a very strong sort of momentum in terms of customer goodwill uh, and, you know, and really how do we make use of that and the place we are in the market is something that you know, we're working very hard on right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I do, I do want to talk about open banking. You mentioned it uh, in, in, uh, a few minutes ago and um, you know, I feel like you guys have, uh, I mean, in some ways become the de facto pioneer in, uh, in open banking in the U S um, you know, we obviously in the Europe where there's, it's, it's, it's you know, mandated uh, regulation for uh, the open banking is required by all large banks, but how do, how do you view um, your approach to open banking? Yeah, I think, you know, Peter, we've been talking about open banking for more years than we should have been, I think, <laughs> uh, because it's, it's not moved perhaps as fast as we would like in the U.S. and so on. Look, I think of open banking um, very much as, you know, an engineer might think about technology platforms, right? You want to be able to put together different technologies, different services to ultimately do what you want, right? And so very, very literally, the idea of, owning your data as a consumer or as a small business and being able to do what you want to do with it, um, enabled through technology and through permissions uh, is sort of, is really, really important. And I think, but if you just take it a little bit more broadly, I do think this is where FinTech more broadly is headed, um, which is that um, FinTech will succeed if and when it is able to, to reimagine and repackage sort of a financial service in a way that makes sense for the customer by taking what's there, whether it's data from a bank account or data from your credit card or, or your accounting software or something else and putting them together ultimately to serve the customer, right? So that's the single most important thing. How do you, how do you serve the customer well by pulling together all, all the data and the technology assets that you have. I mean, we, we think about open banking from the perspective of customers coming to us and saying, look, uh, I have a bank account. 
I want you to be able to look at it because I'm looking for working capital uh, or I have an accounting, I have a set of, you know, I have a set of invoices lying in my QuickBooks and I want you to be able to take a look at it because I would like to be able to advance working capital against those invoices. It's all of these things. And so the, the general idea that one, the customer is in charge, right? And they are coming to us and saying, I've got this and I've got that. And I don't want to have to, you know, upload a PDF file because that's just, you know, that's just too much of a waste it's, of my time. Yes, exactly. I want to be able to authorize you when I want to look at data and just help you help me serve me better, right? That in, in my mind, sort of this is my romantic idea of open banking, which is the customers get what they want the way they want. And the, the sort of technology, sort of whether the APIs and, and the permissions and so on are able to make that happen. So we've been pushing that obviously, and I mean, our customers benefit from it. Um, and um, there's also a, a change in sort of customer expectations, right? Around mm -hmm. all of this stuff. So four years ago when I joined Fundbox, sometimes we would lose customers who would look at our flows and say, this is a scam. Like, I cannot believe that you are connecting to my accounting software and within a minute giving me credit. Like there's some, something not right here with this picture. It's too easy. And now four years later, people are starting to get, yeah, that's the way it should be. Like it should be easy. It shouldn't be hard. And I'll tell you what, in a couple of years, people will be demanding it. And if it takes you more than a minute to figure this stuff out, like they'll be upset. And that's good. That's good because customers are getting getting what they want and what they need. So yes, it's a, it's a journey. It's a journey. It hasn't, you know, it's, it's not been easy, but, but we're every step forward, you know, every bank that, that integrates better, every, you know, software SaaS platform that lets customers share their data. We believe it's sort of another step in just opening up all of the, these assets that actually belong to the customer and driving better sort of financial services through technology. Right, right. Okay, so we're running out of time, but a couple more things I really want to get to. Um, you've mentioned QuickBooks several times, and you know I know that you, you pull in QuickBooks data, but I think I read somewhere as well that you know Funbox is now available inside QuickBooks. Right. Oh, so yes. tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. So so we're we're embedded inside of QuickBooks. I think we're perhaps the only fintech player to be natively integrated inside of QuickBooks. We we love working with the QuickBooks team. Uh, and um, we've been doing this now for four years. Uh, if you're in your QuickBooks product, uh, you might see a call to action against your invoices around getting working capital. And then you, when you engage with that, it's a, it's a QuickBooks branded uh, experience powered by Funbox, but it's very native to the flow. And what's beautiful about that experience, and we're excited about it, and so is the QuickBooks team, is that for the customer, it's like I click a button, I authorize Funbox to take a look at my, my QuickBooks data, but frankly, it's single sign-on. There's no login that I'm creating. Uh, I don't have to do anything else. All my QuickBooks data is there and Funbox just verifies with me like, is this, are you, you know, who you say you are? You know, for obviously for regulatory purposes, but it's, it's like, a, it's a minute and I'm in and I have access to credit. So it's been working very well. It's been working very well. Uh, we also have QuickBooks customers who come to us sort of outside of the experience and there we are using the QuickBooks APIs, just like anybody else, because QuickBooks is also right. a platform, an open platform, which is great. More power to them for, the, for doing that. Um, and so we work in, in sort of in both ways, in this sort of this broader way, but also a very important part of our partnership is sort of more embedded nature that we have. Right, right. Okay, so so last question then. What, what What's your vision for the future of Funbox? I feel like you can take this uh, a number of different ways, but I'd love to get your perspective on where this is going. So I think that going back to a point I made earlier, I think we want to serve the small business owner. We want to serve the small business. And we believe that despite all the advancement we made in the last, you know, uh, you know, as an industry over the last decade, the SMB is still very underserved at a broader level. And today Fundbox has been able to reimagine credit for, for the SMB uh, by using technology, by rethinking certain things. Like, for example, we actually understand what you mean by your invoices, whereas a traditional bank might not because we see the invoice data, 
we understand the counterparty on the invoice because of our business graph, all of those things. But, but that's sort of one part of your existence. Uh, in general, I'd say SMBs are, 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 are just underserved and, um, and, and generally have been failed by the, the existing system on multiple fronts, sometimes in credit, sometimes other services. And so we're really focused on thinking about how we can take all these building blocks that we've got by way of technology and so on and so forth and reimagine other experiences for small businesses to really give them the tools they need to succeed, the financial agility, the peace of mind. And so we're very focused on, I think, on, on two things. One is you know, the, the, the credit products that we have today serve a need the, the technology is proven. We've created great customer delight and momentum. We want to be able to do a lot more of that. And so that's like a really big thing for us. And the second is, you know, we, we want to be able to serve the, these customers more broadly. Uh, we see time and time again from our customer feedback, from what we hear anecdotally, from how, you know, uh, they're currently being served or underserved by banks and traditional financial institution that is a huge, huge opportunity. So that's what we're working on. And it's, um, it's obviously no one wanted COVID to happen. And, you know, it's a, there are so many challenges in the world today, but I think the, the silver lining for us is that we've been able to prove the, the validity of our approach through like a terrible downturn in the economy. And we want to be able to sort of scale up how we serve customers, both in terms of the number of customers we serve, but also in the ways we serve them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, well, good luck with that, Prashant. It's, it's always great to chat with you. I, I really appreciate you coming on the Thank show today. You. Okay. See you. Thank you so much, Peter. Take okay, care. Bye.